Let's pray. Lord, it is wonderful that we may stand in your presence. We want to bow to you and acknowledge you as the Most High. And every little portion of life and breath and existence that we experience within each one of us, we bring to you. And we want to lay it down before your feet and say, thank you, Lord. Lord, feed us this morning with your living bread. And we pray, Lord, that you will touch our reasonings, our feelings, our discernment, so that we may know the truth. Because we know, Lord, you are the truth, and the truth will never change. And we pray, as your word says, that we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free, so that we may experience being set free from so many prisons, prison houses in which we hide so many times. That we will experience a new freedom, a new liberty, new understanding of who you are in your greatness and in your majesty. We pray, Lord, that you will break your bread. And as you give each one of us the portion that we need, that we will receive it with gratitude and thanksgiving. And that your seed may grow in us because we embrace the truths that you bring to us. In the name of Jesus, we say thank you. Amen. Now, sight, vision, sight is of uttermost importance. I'm going to read with you from the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, the first verse. We had previously made one or two remarks on this verse, if I remember, but let's continue from there on. Behold, that means see, behold, that means seeing with awe and expectancy. Behold, thou art fair. He speaks to the believer from chapter 1 verse 1, as the believer progresses and grows in her, in her relationship with him, he comes here in verse 4 and he says, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Now, the first verse that came in my mind when I read that, the word says, we walk by faith and not by sight. It sounds like a controversy. But if you look, contradiction. contradiction. It sounds like a contradiction. That we walk by faith and not by sight. And we started off when we said that sight is very important of utmost importance. But if we go and have a look at that verse and see what the, the word really says, you, under, you will understand uh, the contents and the meaning of it. We walk by faith and not by sight. That word sight talks about carnal sight. It means we walk by faith 
and not by looking and being governed by the things that we see and by situations and by circumstances and by events and by material, literal things. We don't walk and be controlled and influenced in such a way by, the, by these outward things. But what we choose to do is we walk by faith in the midst of these things. Okay. Now we've we said and we've shared so many times and uh, we will continue to do, to do that that word faith if we don't understand the word that has been used there for the word faith we miss we miss the whole oh, sorry, emet is truth alright, emet is truth faith and truth is connected this word faith is the word aman if I leave out the verbs yeah? Fukala. Okay. So it's spelled Aleph, Mem, Nun. Aleph, Mem, and Nun. Pictographic and Biblical Hebrew. All right. So the, the first concept in the word is very important. Aleph, it means sovereignty. It is the word, it means in the midst of anything and everything ever is God. He is. He exists. He doesn't just exist. He is the sovereign one in the midst of anything. Irrespective of the circumstances. So we walk by faith. That's by the first principle that we walk by. We walk because we know wherever I go, whatever situation I am, whatever the event is, in the midst of that, God is the absolute constant. The sovereign one is absolutely love, is absolutely present, is absolutely fair, is absolutely just, irrespective of the circumstance. So yes, we walk by faith and not by that type of sight, physical, material effects. Now, sight is about 80% of our sensory experiences. Now, we practice sight all the time. It depends, or let's say, it talks about the way that we look at things. The way that we look at an event, the way that we look at people, the way that we look at circumstances and pain. It all has to do with sight. And that's the type of sight that the word addresses. A sight beyond your physical uh, and outer vision. The way that we look at obstacles, the way that we look at situations, we always look at all of that from out of a specific perspective. Sight has to do with perspective. And perspective, perspective has to do with a certain mind that we have that we look at things. Same people can look at one event and each one see different things. Because the processes in their mind takes the, the visual experience or what, what we see with our eyes and it gets... Uh, it is uh, uh, um, processed within our minds according to our eight cake, our what's an eight cake, our perspective, and so on. And with that, we judge 
whether a situation is good or whether a situation is bad. Now, sight, how is sight spelt? Now we see here in uh, chapter 4 verse 1, we see here that God speaks to her. One of the things that he addresses, he addresses her sight. How is uh, sight spelt? Sight is the word ra'ah. Okay. Resh. Ayen. Hey. Resh. Picture graphics. Ayen. In hey. Why do we spell? Why do we take time to spell it? Because the moment that we see the components of out of which uh, that uh, this concept uh, uh, consists of, if each one of these letters are is a word, and each word has got a whole explanation, then you have your own commentary hidden within the word. So that you don't need to, to trust me and you don't need to follow what I tell you, but you, you can see yourself. What is being shared is solidly uh, based and truth, unchangeable. Now this ra'a talks about discernment. This word sight talks about discernment. To experience and to know something through experience. To know something through experience. Not to know something through studying, but through experience. It means as well to be near. You come near to somebody when you start seeing what you have in that person. Ons sê ons in Afrikaans, ek het gesien wat ek in die persoon het. Teken, jy het die visies gesien. Jy, jy het in hom ingekyk en jy het sy persoon, persoonlijkheid, sy karakter, wie is het jy begin raak sien. Alright. So that's what God says to the believer. I can see that you are starting to look and really see me. To, uh, all right. It also means uh, to understand. See means real understanding. As with a, with a, 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 a mathematical uh, problem, when you read it and you and you you're busy with it, the one student sees what to do. And then because he or she understands, and the next person look at that same problem, and the only thing they see is a lot of uh, words and numbers, and they don't, they don't see. That is what life is about. That's what the Word of God is about. The Word of God is there to open our eyes so that we can see when we look at life and understand what it's about. Other people look at life and they just see the numbers and the words and they never really get to what life is about. They never understand. Now, this word sight. Sorry, I can unblow here and I can pass in around. Ah, sight, another word that is used for sight is the word sekfi, is the word mada. 
sec phi. Let me use another color just so you can see it easier. Chun. Kauf. And va. Chun. Kauf. Kauf. And a va. Ada is spelled Mem Dalet Ayen Mem Dalet Ayen All right. Mada comes from the root word yada. Yud, dalet, ayen. Yud, yud, dalet. Ayen. Sorry, I gave you a little bit of extra extra there, so that we can just understand the basic concepts that we're talking here about. Right. Right. Let me show you sec fee is the word that means observer, observatory. Observer and observatory is usually something, a tower or some high point from where you can uh, look far. You've got a, uh, what's the word, you're the fair VC. Okay, so from the high point where you are, you can gaze and look far. You can, all right, far. That is the word that is associated with the word cock as well, to explain the meaning of the word. It doesn't mean cock, but it explains like the rooster, cock rooster or rooster on the farmyard that crows in the 12 o'clock at night and he announces that the sun is, the sun is going to rise. L the light is coming. All the other animals on the farmyard, they think he's stupid, there's something wrong. It is dark. How can he proclaim that there's light in the midst of this darkness? This is the type of sight that the Lord wants to work in us so that we can see and know that there's light and the son of righteousness is around the corner. He's, he's present actually. Right, that type of sight. We can see here when we just talk, I'm just gonna mention one or two things here. When we talk about the calf, the calf talks about your loins. It means your imagination. Deep inside of you, the pictures, the, the place there inside of you where you think in pictures, where you make pictures out of things and concepts. Psychology says that's the way that our mind works, with pictures. Okay, so that has to do with sight. Right. Here we see the other word that is associated with sight as well, that means sight as well. This word Mada, here we see the ayen that talks about sight. Here we see sight. To see the word of God, the mem, to see the sacrifice, the dalet, the sacrifice is in our midst. He's timeless. 
The sacrifice was slaughtered before the foundation of the earth. The word says so. He was slaughtered before the foundation of the earth. He just made it visible in time. Many things God, the, the battle between light and darkness had, had already been uh, won before time. It is just going to play out in time. Okay. Right. So the sacrifice is here. As we sit and we listen, and we realize where we've missed God, because that is the idea why we listen at the Word of God. Not to give, to tick your boxes, but to see where do I still miss Him? Where do I need to educate myself and my own senses so that I can see Him more clearly in my, wor in my world, in my situation, and where I'm at? Okay. Mada means, that means observer. This one means recognizer. To recognize him in the midst of your situation. To recognize him in your feelings. Say, look, this is a bad feeling. This is depression. This is hopelessness. This is anxiety. It's because I do not see him. I need to see God in the midst of my situation so that I can uh, get to my uh, true existence and experience true existence because that is why Jesus came to deliver his people from their sin. All right. Yada is the root of this word. Yada. Toda. And all those words is confession. All right, this will take you eventually to Toda. When the word says there in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, he says, uh, if you confess your sins, he will forgive you and cleanse you from all your sin. That word confess means not you are depressed, you feel that you've been found out, you feel uh, shy, you feel uh, depressed, because of the mistakes that you make and because God shows you how sinful you are. No. If I see where I've missed it, I must have the... the... kort Engelse woorde vandag. I can't even talk German, so I should have... maybe I could have fallen back on German and tried to speak German. But anyway... Uh, uh, to confess means I gladly agree that I need the sacrifice because I see how much I miss it. So when you miss it, it's actually a joyful moment. When you see that you've been uh, irritated, uh, irritated by certain things, by how certain people react, or when you see that you've been impatient, or when you see that you had been, you've been hateful, or proudful, or whatever. The moment that you see it, it shouldn't be a moment of despondency. It should be a moment from, ha, ah, the sacrifice is here. That's why I need him. That's why. So it's a glad discovery and experience, and then you can agree with God because God had given the sacrifice for a specific reason, because he knows how much we need forgiveness continuously. All the time. Right. So, but I need to see it. We're talking, about, we're talking about that type of sight. That is what Yada, Yada says, the metaf metaphysical, the, the invisible God that is present and his sacrifice as well. I must see. So in every situation, I mustn't be despondent. Please remember what I'm saying. In any situation, in any reaction in your life, whether it's sinful or whether it's a wonderful reaction of praise and thanks to Him, He is always present. His sacrifice is always there. And my eyes should always be seeing Him. 
So yes, we are definitely not talking about physical sight. We are talking about a sight that is continuous, that is far beyond what our physical eyesight can give us. Now, there in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, you can maybe just uh, uh, page to Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. Just, I'm just going to read verse 9. When God placed man in Eden, we read, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow. What's the first thing that he put on this planet for man? Uh, to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now let me rem remind you, if you read the Hebrew, it comes up very clearly. We're not talking about physical trees only. We're talking about trees with spiritual uh, abilities, spiritual characteristics. Sin didn't come in. When sin came in, everything went, uh, everything was cursed, everything went material, materialism started, and entropy started. The moment that sin came in. That's one of the results of sin. Here God is talking about spiritual uh, 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 provision that he has given, that he's put within this uh, spiritual atmosphere. Trees and the tree of life. Um, but what did he say? What, what a sense does he, the very first sense that God addresses in the Bible is eyesight. He says, uh, these trees, he says, the, so they can be pleasant to the sight and good for food. He addresses eyesight and he addresses the mouth, taste. The two senses that he touches. So God created uh, trees spiritual provision, because that is what it was, and spiritual provision that God gives is there for me to be pleasant. My, if my eyesight is correct and corrected by God and by His truth, what He provides spiritually for me to eat, because the trees are there for food, to bear fruit, to serve man, whether it is for shelter, for shade, whether it's the roots for health, or the bark for health, or whether it's fruit to eat, or whatever. It was there to have the effect of being, it must be, it is to be pleasant. So God addresses the very most important sense, and that is sight. And sight he gives for one purpose, and that is to be pleasant. That word uh, pleasant is the word hamat. What does it mean? That word pleasant, God's provision for me, means I'm just giving you the Hebrew from the Hebrew dictionary what it means. That word pleasant means greatly beloved. The word of God is the tree of life. The word of God is God's provision. It is part of the orchard that God gives from which man must eat. Now, I don't think we've ever touched the word orchard. We're not going to do it this morning. There are 32 ways, listen, there are 32 ways only through which the word can be taught. All of them correlating and resonating and confirming and supporting what is found. Ek weet baie van julle nie mooi gehoor dat ek sê nie. Is alright. Alright. 
What is the word? It means orchard. Ah, man. But anyway, I'll get to the word now. But that means orchard. It means the study of the word of God. Okay. It means the study of the word of God. All right, so uh, the study of the word of God takes us to the orchard that God has put in our midst. And the orchard, the reaction that the orchard should bring is pleasantness. Pardes. Thank you, my beautiful wife. Pardes. Pardes, one day I will share with you, that is the... Uh, only by way by which the word of God can be taught. Okay, let's let me just put that. That means orchard. Pardes. Right. So uh, this word pleasant, when he says this orchard, the word of God is pleasant. It means greatly beloved. It means to delight. It means to value. It means desire. And it means uh, to covet. Orchard, Pardes. Right, we're not going into that now. But we want to know, we want to identify the orchard that God has put in our midst. The word Pardes in Hebrew talks about the orchard. You have the orchard on your lap from which God wants to feed you in every way. Uh, if you really start picking and identifying the orchard, the reaction will be one of pleasantness. It is the word greatly beloved. Beloved. It is the word delight. It is the word uh, value. It is the word desire. And it is the word covet. If you don't know what to pray, this is what we can pray. We say, Lord, open my eyes as you've given Adam, male and female, the vision, that I may see the orchard that you've put right before me, so that I may learn who my beloved is, and so that I can delight myself in it and put a new value to the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God so that I may desire it and cover it, cover it, covet, covet it with all my being. If you want to increase in your love to the Lord, the love of the Lord, for the Lord, for the Lord. That's how it happens. No other way. Through His Word. How many Christians have I met in my short life that say, I'm not a word person, I'm a spirit person. That is such a foolish remark. Immediately against the Word of God. Immediately as opposition and it what tells it me what does it tell me it tells me that this person his eyes or her eyes hadn't been opened to see that what God is giving is something pleasant it's going to satisfy that's what it means it's going to satisfy your inner needs 
And through that, your love for him is going to increase. And that is going to help you and me to, to get into the mode and into the, the, the behavior of studying and reading God's word. And you will enjoy it. In Psalms chapter 4 verse 1 that we read, he calls her there, my love. And I've shared, I think I've shared with you before, that word love there, we've learned the different words for love is used in the Song of Solomon for a specific reason. And this love, because you see all of that loves form foundations for a hub, love which is godly love, which we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, unfortunately, all that is preached usually is one chapter, uh, John, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is preached and it is held before Christians' faces. They must love everybody. They must love, they must love, they must love. But it's ne it, they never receive the tools how to grow and the understanding how to get to the point where God's godly love can flow in us and through us. Because that love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is not a do-it-yourself business. The word there is you is the word godly love. So now we are talking about a very important step to get to God's truly to God's godly love to grow and excel within me. And once again, it's not me doing it, it's me complying to the ways that God wants to work in me through his word, his word being pleasant in me, and through that he works his love in me, and the, the reflection, the reaction, the onwillekeurige effect daarvan, dat gaat onwillekeurig in my naar voren kom. Godelike liefde. Alright, so this love is the word ra ja coming from raya comes from the root word raa that we've just dealt with raya is spelled resh ayen yud hey resh we've dealt with this word before but this is how God works we're laying new layers, new underst uh, more understanding, so that we can grow. This is how we grow. The old Hebrew rabbis, when they taught their people, because Israel was a learned nation, learned. From the smallest to the greatest, they sat under the teaching of their teachers, the rabbis. And the rabbis would tell them that if you do not memorize and repeat the information that I'm sharing with you, you will not do it. The human mind doesn't work that way. By hearing it once and then you understand and you do it. It doesn't work that way. If you look at the word teaching, it, will, it comes out in Proverbs why you and I need to repeat repeat, repeat, repeat its part, and Israel had a different, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, excuse? Techniques, thank you, that's a good word. Techniques, how to memorize the Torah, how to memorize the principles of God. If I listen and I see Christians from the time I was at varsity up till today, 
that's more than 40 years ago. For some reason, Christians think they are so brilliant. They can just do a little bit of study, a little bit of reading in the Word, and then they will do the Word. Surprise, surprise. If you don't study the Word of God, read the Word of God properly, memorize the Word of God, repeat, repeat, repeat the principles of God, you will not be able to do it and you will stand responsible for. What you know and what you don't know, you will stand responsible for as well. And me. Reya. All right. Reya, as we said, the root word of Reya. Where did I Ah, now is it. Yeah. Yeah. The root word of Reya is the word R. Ra. Ra. That is the root word of this word. So the roots that you have here, as the roots grow, as we've explained, it grows into raya. Okay? You don't just come to the love, which is raya love. What does raya love mean? It means, here we find ya. 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 God says there, said Exodus, I'm sure now. Where's the song of Moses? Exodus 15, somewhere around there. There he says, his name is Yah. In Psalm 68, he says, his name is Yah. It is just an abbreviation. Yah is abbreviation of the word Yud hey, va hey. Yah is just an abbreviation of Yehovah. Yah. I remember many years ago I was working with addicts, and the one uh, Dacha smoker says to me, "He serves Yah." I said, "Yeah, I'm not talking about the Yah." of Jamaica. I'm not talking about the yaw of the flower of boys and flower girls of those days. I say I'm talking about yah. Yehovah. Yehovah. The creator. The one who is. Not your little smoky God. Yah. Reya. So what does Reya mean? It means, what is this Resh in Hebrew standing for? If you look at the whole position, formation, what's the word of that letter? Look at me. In Hebrew it says, it is the learner, the scholar, standing before the Torah, before the Word of God, to receive its teaching with humility. That's how, this is how you sit here this morning. You sit here with this attitude. I'm here to receive the word of God. I'm here to, to, be, to serve the living God. The word. Right. If that is our attitude in life, in any circumstance, any event, any situation, whatever mo pro possible scenario you can think yourself in, if that is our attitude, that you stand in that situation, in that experience, ready to receive and to hear the voice from the Word of God, which is everywhere. God's Word is everywhere. If that is your attitude, then I will have the eyesight to see Him to see the Torah 
in person speaking to me and then experiencing experiencing I use this example that I'm saying now and please excuse me if I have used it and you've heard it before 40 years ago I was at a Christian camp we were sitting around the fire and eventually it was just me and a, a young couple left they were married students but they were married and we were gazing into the coals and they asked me John how can we experience God I said it's very 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 simple so let us stand we just us three there lift up your eyes and look at the stars become quiet look at what's going on around you because in the bush felt I said do you hear the jackals I said right now when you've become still inside of you start expressing expressions of gratitude of who he is and express of express who he is what you've learned from him of who he is what you've read in the Bible of who he is I remember now the wife's name was Rana and Reina were their names so Reina I will begin and in that dark night I started saying I don't can't of course can't remember what I said but Lord you are present you are almighty you've blessed and you've created the crickets that we hear thank you for the frogs thank you that I can hear it you are everlasting said Reino you continue and then Rana, you continue. And we did that spontaneously among us for a few minutes, three minutes, four minutes. And we could experience God's presence. Because what happened? We bowed. And we said, we are receptive. We make our beings receptive as learners as pupils of the most high I want to learn from you and I want to see what's going on around me I want to see you to learn from you speak to me great and almighty one speak I will listen I want to hear I want to obey and you will experience him do that in your closet, in your study, you will see. Okay, so this is the sort of love that he sees, that he says. Now he has called her before, in the previous chapters, he has, he have, he has seen this love. We have dealt with this love, love before, but you see, you don't get one level of love, Raya love, the levels continue. Because you start seeing more and more, and more and more, and more and more detail, and more and more, and you see more and more of who you have before you, who he is, more and more and more, and quicker. As when you hunt, we've got one or two hunters here. When you hunt, like with a bushman, I was very interested in the bushman when I was a child. Read a lot about the bushman. On the border, we had to do a lot with bushmen in the guerrilla war uh, in, uh, on the border. There are tales that are told that bushmen would look there on the dunes is one specific tale and I think it was Ireland that was standing right on the horizon 
there was a tree, Kamil Doran tree. This person was, was, was were, were with the bushman. And he was looking around, and the bushman says, there are three elands standing there. And this guy looked, and looked, and looked. I don't know whether he had binoculars. But anyway, he looked and he couldn't see three elands standing there. It was far, it was on the horizon. So he disagreed with them. He says, no, they said, no, there's three standing there. And they started walking towards that specific position where they were. And this guy, he marked the area where he, from where he was and where he looked. And when they came there, they had the spurs, there were spurs of three Elon standing just behind, or not behind, a little bit back, a little bit further. And they say that, they say that the Bushmen, their vision was so that they could look where the, where the planet, or the, the curve of the horizon, they could, go, they could look beyond it. It sounds strange, but I've been in the, in the, in the bush many times. With the people that live in the bush, if they look at the bush, they see and you see. They see many more things than you. So many times when we, when we hunted, they would pat me on the back and they would say, Nansia, Nansia. I would say, Where? I would say, Nansia. And then the buck would do this with his ear, and then suddenly you see it. I would have really gone into an argument with them and say, but you, you are looking and seeing things that do not exist. The same with a true follower of Yeshua Mashiach. His eyesight must be developed. So that when he looks and you look, you see what the one next to you don't see. It's not because you see ghosts. It's not because you see what you want to see. It's because they and he exists, you see. Like as I said, when we hunted, and they would pat me on the back, they say, Nansia. I would say, I call. They say, Nansia. Nansia. They would do that. Nansia. Bam. And many times, it has happened often with me, suddenly the, the, something scares the, the buck or the animals, and they start running. And then I think, how is it possible that I couldn't see them? They were there. So when the bridegroom looks at her in Psalms chapter 4, verse 1, he says to her, I can see you are seeing more and better and better. Because what can she see? She sees. What does she see? She see he is pleasant. The situation is not pain and bad and despondency in the situation. She sees hope. The hope is not that she's got her eyes on a specific outcome. He is her hope. What is my hope within this cancer? That God's going to touch me and heal me? I've asked that. But if he didn't, is my hope going to go... <laughs> if my hope is on him, and I exercise my eyesight, my hope grows, not because he grows, but because I see more and more and more of him. And it doesn't mean if you're not healed, your delight and your desire for him and your coveting him might go down, 
If he is my, and my eyesight is upon him, delight will grow. Value, desire, coveting grows because you see more and more of him. More and more and more. I hope, you, I know that you haven't heard anything to say amen about. But let me say amen. I said to somebody this week or last week, person was saying something, so I said, let me tell you how the Reformation worked. Read, read about the Reformation. I said, when somebody in the pulpit stood there and they, they spoke rubbish and they didn't feed God's sheep, the council of the people went to the preacher or to the pastor or to the dominie or to the reverend and say, look, where did you get this from? Why are you not giving us the word of God? If you didn't comply and repent, they asked him to leave. Or they left. But somebody has to leave. Okay. So, we need to see only him. That must be our notice. Ons notitie. Okay. Right. Because. Where did we write that? Sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Where did we write sight down or faith down? We walk by faith and not by sight. I don't know where I wrote it down, but anyway, I wrote it down somewhere. And faith has to do with sight. That's it. Why don't we have enough faith? It's because you do not see clearly. Why do we need to seek more clearer and clearer? Not that we are imagining more and more, as with the hunter, he's not imagining more and more that there's a, a whole herd of game looking at him, but they are there, but he can't see them because his eyes hasn't been practiced. I remember in the bush war, uh, the locals said, and when I hunted with the Zulus, they would tell you, you must look through the bush. They would always laugh and say that when you look at the bush, you look right flat. You have ten bos vast gekyk. You must learn om dier die bos te kyk, so that you see what achter die bos is and in die bos is. Have you ever seen a snake in a tree? It's easy that you can take a touch of snake when you climb the tree. Not that we all climb trees. Hopefully not. <laughs> but we get some graduated people that are vets that climb trees for enjoyment and <laughs> for their work because they catch game. And if your eye is not exercised, like the other day, we were camping there. Remember we went to camp there in Thai? Taibos. And we went on a hike there in the what's the Berger are? Waterberger. And we walked and we looked and we were on a cliff looking down and my wife's attention was everywhere else. And uh, and I said to her, wait, stop for a moment. There's a python lying there in the sun. She said, how do you see it? I said, no, you must have your eyes exercised. Because you couldn't see him. All right. So that is what we are talking about. So what is the first of all in the garden that God dealt with 
when he started dealing with man? Eyesight. And he said, if you have true eyesight, what you see will be pleasant to you. What does it, uh, this word, ra'a, mean? According to the Hebrew dictionary, it means pasture. This is the root of sight. The root of, of sight. Yeah, yeah, but the root of the root, the, the root of love, raya love. The root of love for God comes from the raa. What does raa mean? It means pasture. It means what you eat spiritually, the doctrine that you are taught immediately affects your love for God immediately. It means ra'a means not only pasture, that's where the word pastor comes from. A pastor is supposed to feed the people with the truth. It means pasture, it means graze or to graze. So whatever you feed upon, that is what affects your eyes. Whatever you see and perceive, we're not talking about physical eyesight, whatever your mind feeds upon and whatever you perceive affects whether you're going to see God in your circumstance or not. So it immediately affects our eyesight to see the invisible God, to discern, not to discern devils and demons and which, which, or people get taught what the different devils' names are, what the different principalities' names are, who is head of what hordes of, of demons, what their names are, what the names are of specific angels. The devil has taken many people on a spree. Forget about who's what's name is. It's, doesn't, it's, not a, it's not worth teaching. It doesn't come from the Word of God as a teaching that we should know that. We should know the name of him who is the one who exists, Yah, Yehovah, Yahish, Yahusha, no, <coughs> Yoshua, Jesus Christ. That's what we need to discern. You don't need to discern which devils are where and, and what ranks they have, what spirits are present. You need to discern Him. Yes, they are present. No one has ever denied that they are the kingdom of darkness and that they are present everywhere. Yes. It depends upon who do you focus because the one on whom you focus is the one that will control you. So only if our doctrine or our teaching or the pasture that you eat affects our eyesight and it affects our love for him. Now, the next thing that he says in Song chapter 4, verse 1, he says she has, she's fair, beautiful. What you see is what qualifies your beauty. Do you want to be beautiful to the one who exists, who is, the one who is the Lord God? If you want to be beautiful, start seeing him then in the midst of everything and all things. 
He calls her fair, he calls her twice. Twice there in that verse. He calls her fair. The word fair. The word fair, maybe I've, I've mentioned this, I don't know. Do you, do, have I mentioned it before? Yafa. Yud. A fair or fair. And a hey. Yud. And hey. When he calls a fair. So what do we see here? Please have a look here. We see the name Yah. Do you see it? Yah. The name Yah in her life, bound together in her life through fair. What does this mean? It means your tongue. It means your words. It means your thoughts, because before you have words, you have thoughts. It has to do with your thoughts. It is a calf worth a yut. A yut with a calf. Talking about what goes on in your thought life and in your imagination. That's what it means. Okay. Now, uh, it means as well, the root of the word fair, yafa, means to project beauty. So how can I project beauty in the spirit world? Because we are all the time continuously in the spirit world. We live and sleep and eat in a spirit world. In the spirit world, God wants to reveal his beauty through you and me. How does he do it? By me and you watching over what goes on in our imagination, in our inner life, in our inner talk, whether it is bridled by the truth. If it is, you will experience God in the midst of it, and the spirit world will see the beauty of Him worked in you. And most of all important, God would acknowledge it and see it. That word fair or yafa means elevate. If you and I uh, wants to wants to live and elevate it. Life. What have we learned here? Uh, higher plane of existence. We are all called to live on a higher plane of existence. A higher plane of existence, the secret lies in growing in fairness, in beauty. How will we grow in fairness and in beauty? By starting watching over what goes on in our minds and in our imagination, and not just watch what goes on, uh, realize what's going on, crucifying it, Bring it under subjection to the truth, having it bridled by the truth. Okay. And that way of living elevates us to live in a higher plane of existence. Say any amens? So what does fairness mean? To be fair. What does he say? What does he see in her? He sees in her, because of this mindset, mindset, 
and focus that she has and that we must have. He says that she is transmitting light and love. That's what it means. She is not only transmitting it, she is projecting it, she is radiating it. Now radiation has got now a complete new meaning to my life. Radiation, if God wills it, can save your life. It can destroy the um, cells of death inside of you. The sin inside of us. Radiation. It radiates where you live and where you are. In your marriage, it kills the seeds of death and destruction. It radiates and causes your relationship with your wife and children and your relationship with the world around you so that you can live a healthier life and create healthier circumstances around you by just being fair, the biblical way, God's way. Because it's not just really you and me radiating and transmitting, it is actually God. Some radiation, after radiation, you need to take off your clothes and wash. It even sits in your hair and everywhere, that radiation, they say. Not the one I'm going through. I'll be going through. So radiation is something that affects everything. Everything. The dogs, the cats, the people around you. The atmosphere, nature, wherever you are, your wife, your children, your husband. Because it penetrates. That's why the love of God is the best weapon. Because it penetrates through hatred and through places where nothing else can get to. Can I, can I have a little All right. Saints, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Let us quickly just deal, I think it's three verses, I'm not sure, I think it's three, maybe it's four, but I think it's three verses. Hebrews chapter four, uh, 5, sorry. Let's first, yeah, turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Please keep that place. We first should actually deal with 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. It's a scripture that you know. 1, scripture, 1 Timothy 4 verse 7. I want to read these quickly so that I can make a few comments on these verses. 1 Timothy 4 7 says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. Uh, for seven. But refuse profane, profane and old wife, wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. I just want to make a remark on the last portion of what is been said there. He says, I must exercise myself, myself unto godliness. 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 Exercise. Exercise. That thing that nobody likes. Nobody likes exercise. Uh, exercise in the Greek means to be stripped. To be naked. Remember the first Olympics the athletes were naked. All right, I'm just stating a, a fact. To be naked. Exercise yourselves unto godliness. So exercise, the word that Paul uses here, means strip yourself naked, 
strip yourself of your flesh, get rid of your pride, because the effect of that will be godliness. And God will strip us and he will help us so that we can be delivered from our securities, which is things that we put on on the outside, uh, and our independences. God will touch that. And if you allow God to touch that, and you and I do not react in, in hatred and in anger, uh, and if we submit to God and acknowledge that what he is doing is right to strip you, that process in itself is exercise. Because you have to submit to God and submit to him and surrender to him because he's going to touch things behind which you hide. And that brings you and me uh, securities and safeties that we need to get rid of so that we can grow in godliness. All right, so he says, practice nakedness. Practice to be naked before me. Practice, you forget about all our tricks before him. Just be who you are in respect to him and, re and in repentance. Not be arrogant, not talking about arrogant, but acknowledge who in the light of him in the light of the circumstances, in the light of these events that you are in, that exposes who you really are deep inside of you, acknowledge it and lay it down before him. That is the word exercise. All right. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. You wonder why there's not strong meat in the church of God today? Here's the answer. Strong meat, it means solid spiritual food. Verse 14, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. It means those that are grown spiritually mature. Even those who by reason of use, of, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So they have their senses, their five senses. We've started this morning at the most important sense. They have their eyesight and their taste. Let's just stay to eyesight. They have their eyesight exercised to discern. Discernment talks about ra'a, sight. They have their eyes, so you can say that. They have their senses exercised, their eyes to see both good and evil, but God's way. Not our way of discernment. We look at things and because we're always uh, intended, uh, we, always want, we always want immediate gratification. And if we have immediate gratification, we call it good. If we don't have immediate gratification, we call it bad. God has got ob objective uh, goodness in mind. God looks at your whole life and your whole picture, your whole life, and God allows certain things, we call it bad, but God sees where it will take you to, and so he lets certain things, he, he, he brings over your pathway, which is actually good things you experience and see it as bad, but in retrospect and looking forward, it is a good thing. Because God knows what the effects will be if he does this. And he refuses you certain things and he allows you to go through certain pains and disappointments and hurts. But he says, strong meat belongs to those that have their senses exercised so that they may see both good and evil. Good, tough, nah, that's what the word good means, tough. It means purposeful. Satisfaction that they may see how to have 
I have to exercise purpose that God has intended for them to be, how they allow God to work in them, reveal himself to them, and reveal them, uh, himself through them. That is what the word good means. And evil, ra, it means dysfunctional. So they can discern. In their circumstances, they see God, they see the situation, they know, if I act this way, it will be purposeful. If I act this way, it will be dysfunctional in the kingdom of God. It's to those, that type of mind and that type of person that he says, he gives meat, not milk. Right. Our senses must be exercised. If you stand and look with somebody at their circumstances, you say, nah, yeah. And they tell you, I cannot see God in it. I see him. I see him. Learn to look through the bush. God stands in the middle of it. Exercise your discernment. Right. Um, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 11. Sorry, after this there's still one verse. One other verse. To Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. He says, uh, What did I say? 11, eh? Yeah, it, it must be 11, but I wrote down something different here. But it, must, it is 11. Now, no chastening for the present. In your situation where you are now, no chastening, maybe you're experiencing God chastening you, for the present seemeth to be joyous, because you must learn to look through the bush. Seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So what does he say here? Now, no chastening. That word chastening means evil people, evil government, unjust treatment. It means people, animals, situations, troubles. All of that is chastening. It seems to it doesn't seem to be joyous. I mean, who's a visua masuchas on blade of Jesus that pain betrokken is in your life? Or star the leerstellings is pain, hartseer, ziekte. You moet half in your copy like a wees nie. But, nevertheless, afterward, if you follow God's plan that we've been sharing this whole time with you, it yield the peaceable fruit. That word peaceable is the word noach. The root. The root. Noach. Where does peace or rest? Where does rest come from? Grace. What is the root word of grace? The root word of grace is Chan. How is Chan spelled? Who can see the difference between this word and that word? 
Just look at the letters. Noach starts with a nun, ends with a chet. Grace starts with a chet, ends with a nun. What happened? You and I have got grace. We've got grace. Chang. If you grow in grace, grace, the word gratitude comes, or the word grace comes from the word gratitude, or gratitude comes from grace. Gratitude is thanksgiving. When you, in your chastisement, in your situation, choose to look through the bush and see God in the midst, see the grace in the midst of it, and thank Him and bless Him for it. Grace takes you to rest. Grace is chet. The fences that God puts around us, life coming out from it. When you take the life that comes out of grace that you enjoy, if you take the life, listen to what I'm saying, if you take the life that you receive from, that you receive from grace, and you start implementing the life, it brings you rest. So no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit, noach fruit, of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Just unto them that are exercised thereby. Those that use their circumstances to exercise their eyesight to look through the bush or like the bushman to stand in the Kalari to look at these dunes and they can see even beyond it. This that I've told you about the Bushmen is a well known, they've got a name for it, Can you let know. That type of vision, they say the Bushmen could look beyond the horizon. We're not talking about spiritual things. Right. Now, how many people had been here, or how many people, yeah, had been here in this time of COVID that said, the rapture is now, the rapture is now, we must be ready. Or one person has greeted me a few times, to come and see me to make sure I'm ready, which I appreciate, and said, uh, all right, we'll see one another there. Then I, will, I, would, I said to that person three times, I think, now I'll be seeing you Sunday. Are you coming Sunday? All right. Because you see, we as Christians do not always understand the word of God. Because we are not exercised. Have our senses exercised. Because the word says, he comes for those that expect him. Now they say, no, 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 pastor. You may have, you must your eyes have, have your eyes on the planets and, and the stars. And the sky, because he's coming from the sky, he says we must expect him. I say, no, <laughs> definitely not. You're missing it. You must expect him because he's in every circumstance, in every moment of your life. He said, if you do not expect to see him and look till you see him in your ev events of your life, in your pain, in your disappointments, in your situation, and bow before him and submit before him in the midst of you will not see him. Because it means you don't love him. Because it's only for those that love him. Raya. Something else he says here. He 
He says, you have got dove's eyes. But before we get to the dove's eyes, second, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Let's do that as the last verse. Then I won't do... There's another one that popped up here. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us clear, uh, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The word says, without holiness, we will not see God. So, we are addressing here a very, very, very important uh, principle here. Because, he says, holiness must be perfected in the fear of God. Holiness. What is the fear of God? Yara. Yeah. Yeah. Yud Resh Ayan. What is Yud Resh Ayan? What have we be, what have we learned? To fear God means which one's hand do you see in the circumstance? Whom are you accrediting? We are accreditiere. Whom are you accrediting in this situation? Because the one who you are accrediting the one whose hand you are seeing is the one that will control you. That's what it means. It's not my interpretation, that's what it means. Take it or leave it. Right. So, what must Christians be taught? Christians must be taught to see God's hand, not to polyparrot. The ear is in the ear, the ear is on the ear, but the effect of what you are saying must be present in your life. Because if I see God's hand in a situation, my knees will bow, my hands will go up, and I will worship Him. I'll have no problems. That is called holiness. This is now holiness made very practical. If you and I must grow, and I have to grow, and has to grow in holiness, the word Kodesh, if I have to grow in holiness, I have to see God's hand more and more, more effectively, more clearly in my circumstances. That's it. Let's stop there. Get, get people to study these studies on the website and on the WhatsApps. I've already got a fully fledged message for next week. Which I, the Lord just gave me yesterday morning. I'm very excited over it. Maybe it won't be next week, maybe I'll never bring it, but that's what I think I will do. Lord, we bow to you, the most, most high, the most, 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 highest of everything and everybody ever ever present in our lives in past and in the future most high we want to be still before you and allow your Lord to work in our hearts your fear that we may see your hand and your presence in the events, emotions, circumstances of the lives 
that you lay down before us. In Jesus' name, amen.